Suna Baba Protectors of the Suna Suna Baba Protectors of the Suna Alhamdulillah, wa wassalam, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. Welcome to another session of our series on uh, paradise. And we've been speaking about the particulars of paradise and the reason why Allah goes into such details about paradise is because he wants us to have hope. And he uses his descriptions of what's in store for us as a means of motivating and encouraging us to live our lives doing the deeds that are pleasing to him. And yesterday we focused in on the first group of people that will enter into paradise. And I want to ask the question again, just to see how well everyone understands. Uh, will the first group of people to enter paradise include all the prophets of Allah? Can anyone answer that? Put your hands up. Sister Marianne, go ahead. No, the first group of people will be the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam nation. Exactly. And that's a very important point that I want all of you to understand because a lot of Muslims think that the forerunners includes the prophets of Allah. This is incorrect. The prophet Muhammad was clear in numerous hadiths that no one will enter paradise until after we have been judged and entered. Our nation was the last to come in this world, but we will be the first on the, in the, on the day of judgment, okay? And so I did post some questions up on Facebook uh, between my appointments uh, so that you guys could work on the quiz Let's look at the first question here. And again, a lot of Muslims read the hadiths and they don't understand the meaning. A lot of Muslims think that they can just, um, a lot of uh, the Muslims believe that they can just pick up a book and start reading. And all of a sudden they'll understand what's going on. That's not how it works in Islam. You know, you have to learn this religion from the people of knowledge. You have to sit in their presence. So they can quiz you and you can ask them questions and they can answer. When the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in an authentic hadith that the poor will enter paradise before the rich. And also Allah says it in the Quran too. Allah says that the poor will enter paradise before the rich. What happened to make Allah say this? And whom was Allah speaking about? Who can answer that? Allah says it in the Quran too. The poor will enter paradise before the rich. Does that mean that all poor people, all people who were poor in this world will enter paradise before people who were rich? Go ahead, Brother Khaled. Yes, I believe he, they was talking about the uh, Ansar and the, the God, the, uh, the people of the prophet's time that were poor, that um, that that was like the first believers. They was you know poor. They talked about those those um, uh, poor people. Okay, so does that apply to us? Let me hear what somebody else has to say to explain it. Go ahead, Maylion. Let's hear how you explain it, Maylion. I would say it doesn't apply to us. Um, when the prophet mentioned um, that the poor will enter paradise before the rich, he was referring to his companions, the ones who were with him before, you know, they pledged their allegiance to the Hudaybiya tree and before like, you know, conquering Mecca and whatnot. He was just giving them like hope, letting them know that just because those people had wealth, that doesn't mean everything that you guys sacrificed before, you know, they came around was a lot, a lot is not like, thinking about that. I hope I worded it the right exactly. way. Exactly. She explained that perfectly. When you read the Quran and you read the verses where Allah says the poor will enter paradise before the rich, 
He's not saying that uh, that all poor people in this world will enter. He was talking about the immigrants, the 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 the, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companions who migrated from Mecca to Medina. Many of them were wealthy and rich, and they left their money behind and migrated to Medina to practice Islam. Uh, Brother Mukhtar, my cousin, he gave y'all the story of the companion who when he died, they didn't even have a, 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 a cloth to cover him with. He, when he lived in Mecca, before he converted to Islam, he used to wear the most beautiful shoes. He came from one of the richest, most wealthiest families. He always had a pair of shoes to match whatever outfit he wore. But he gave up all that money. He left all that and, and to convert to Islam and he migrated, went to Medina and, and lived as a poor man. And when he died, he didn't even have a cloth to cover his feet. And when the prophet saw his body, he cried. He said, look at him. He doesn't even have shoes on when he used to wear the most beautiful shoes. So those verses are about, you know, the, the companions who were with the prophet who left Mecca and went to Medina. And what, like she said, after Islam uh, spread it through uh, the, the entire Arabia, those original companions got a little bit frightened they said because now the rich Quraysh and the rich people have converted we'll never be able to catch up with them in in charity because they got money that they can give for the sake of Allah when we left all that and that's when uh the prophet uh told them that's when Allah sent the verses down saying the rich will enter be I mean the poor will enter before the rich because the rich will be stopped at the Sarat bridge and asked how they spent their money. Okay, so that's what that is. It doesn't mean necessarily mean that all poor people will enter paradise before the rich. Look at Uthman. Uthman was a multimillionaire. Do y'all know that? Uthman was the richest of every Arab. He was a multimillionaire. And he will be the third person to enter paradise after the Prophet Muhammad. So there's your proof. And look at Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was not a poor man either. Abu Bakr was a wealthy merchant. He will be the first to enter paradise after the Prophet Muhammad. And look at Umar. Umar was not poor either. He was a wealthy merchant too. He will be the second. So it does not mean that all poor people, because the first group that will enter is the prophet and those four, and they were not poor. They were wealthy, and Uthman was a multimillionaire. Does everybody understand? So this is why I tell you guys, when you read the Quran, you will never, ever, ever understand what Allah is saying unless you learn the hadith as well because the hadith are the explanation of the quran and this is what the prophet told the companions learn my sunnah because i am the explanation of the quran and that's why aisha said the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a walking quran he was the explanation of it. He was the meaning of it. Okay? So we have to, you can't just learn Quran. You have to learn the hadiths to understand what you're reading. Does everybody understand that? I hope you guys do. Okay, so when the poor will enter, he was speaking about his companions. And the law is speaking about them. That's why Allah says those who came before the Hudaybiyah Treaty are of a higher status. And my cousin Mukhtar explained to you guys before what that Hudaybiyah Treaty was. 
And he explained this hadith to y'all before. You know, those who were with the prophet before the Hudaybiyah treaty are the best. Better than they. Okay, this was Allah's way of letting the companions, the original companions know your sacrifices are so noted and no one will reach you in good deeds. He let those original companions know that none of the others that come after you will reach you in status with me. And they were happy to learn that, that they had the highest status with Allah. Okay, let's look at question number two. Good job, Maymuna. Um, I mean, um, Maylion, I'm sorry. Good job, Maylion. Question number two. The forerunners and people of the right hand were people who mostly fail in what three categories of this world? We talked about how the majority of the people who will not do any time in hell because the forerunners and the people of the right hand, the Allah will never allow the hellfire to touch any of them because they earned his love. And Allah has promised he will never put anyone he loves in hell. And they live their lives in this world, mostly falling into what three categories? Go ahead, Anissa. The three categories our Prophet Islam said that the forerunners and the people of the right hand fell into. Number one, one was they struggled in the way of Allah. They guarded their modesty, and they were devout worshipers. They struggled in the way of Allah, meaning they were what we call martyrs. Martyrs. Yeah. Okay. Number two was what? They guarded their modesty. They guarded their modesty. Do you guys guard your modesty? How many of you guard your modesty? I'm sorry. If you a Muslim woman and you don't wear a hijab, you ain't got no modesty. You don't fall in this category. I'm sorry. If you a Muslim man and you don't grow your beard, you don't fall in this category. If you a Muslim man, like a lot of these famous men y'all listen to, can't y'all look at those trim beards? How can y'all call those men sheikhs and scholars when their beards are trimmed? We're going to speak about the life of the prophet beginning today, and I'm going to describe him to you. Did he trim his beard? Did he look like these gay-bladed men that y'all love and worship who are innovators and deviators? If you shaving and trimming your beard, you ain't no man of modesty. You a loser. Okay. So, and what's the third category again, Anissa? They were devout worshipers. They loved what Allah loved and hated what Allah hated. Devout worshipers? Yes. Strong in their belief okay. and mm -hmm. practice. That's what that means. What's yeah. a devout worshiper? A devout worshiper is a person that don't just say they Muslim. They live it. They practice. They fulfill the obligations that Allah has imposed upon them, okay? So most of the forerunners and most of the uh, right-handers, if you wanna be in that group, are you modest? Are you sincere in your belief in Allah? Do you truly believe la ilaha illallah Muhammad or Rasulullah? If you got allegiance to the black race, you ain't in this category. If your allegiance is to the Arabic race, you ain't in this category. Because the devout worshipers of Allah know that their allegiance is only to Allah, to the prophet and the believers. It's not to a color. It's not to a tribe. It's not to a country. If you so into Palestine and you so into Afghanistan and if you so into America, I want to be in America. If your allegiance is to Palestine, your allegiance is to uh, Afghanistan, your allegiance is to America, you ain't in this category because our allegiance is not to no country. Our allegiance is not to no land. Our allegiance is to Allah, the prophet and the believers. The earth belongs to Allah. The land belongs to Allah. It don't belong to Palestine. 
It don't belong to Americans. It don't belong to Afghanis. It belongs to Allah. Allah is the owner and creator of the earth, not you and me. You don't own no rock nowhere here. Y'all understand that? A lot of Muslims today don't. The earth belongs to Allah, just like the children belong to Allah, just like your husband belongs to Allah. We don't own nothing here but your own choices. The only thing that you and I own is our choices. Y'all got that? Free will. But you don't own your husband. You don't own your wife. You don't own your children. You definitely don't own the earth or nothing else. Hello, until we understand that, we'll never be true believers. That's why all these wars are happening over land and all that dumb stuff that belongs to Allah, not to you. All right. So those are the, are the three categories that the majority of the forerunners and right-handers fall in. They're martyrs, or they were people who guarded their modesty, or they were devout worshipers who were strong in their practice of this religion. They had fear of Allah, in other words. They didn't go around disobeying Allah because they could. And that brings us to question number three. Who can detail and explain to us the way Meliun did, that other question? Who can explain how a Muslim can end up on the day of judgment in the category of a sinful Muslim? We talked about how we will be divided into three categories on the day of judgment, the forerunners, the right-handers, and the sinful Muslims. We should all strive to be a, be a forerunner or right-hander. The group you don't want to be in are the sinful Muslims. How does a, a Muslim end up in that third group? Who can tell us? How does a person end up in the sinful Muslim group? Somebody besides Anissa. Go ahead, Sister Zarina. How does a Muslim end up in the, in the sinful Muslim group? Go ahead, Zarina. Um, this is a Muslim who believes, you know, in Allah and his sunnah, and they acknowledge that they were doing something wrong, you know, committing sins, but they were weak, and they die in that state before, um, you know, changing their actions. So this and, um, is a seeking Allah's forgiveness. Who died upon sins, basically died upon sins that he or she knew they should not have done? Any other way they get in that group? They died before I'm seeking a lost forgiveness for those sins. That's and he died that, in that that's, state. That's the same thing that you just said. Oh, um, okay. Don't re-change the words. How else can you end up in? So you can end up in that sinful group if you died upon sins that you know you shouldn't have been doing. You know them cigarettes was haram. You shouldn't have been smoking them. You knew that interest was haram. You knew that not wearing a hijab was, was haram. You got to pay to the piper. How else can a person end up in the sinful Muslim category? Go ahead, Anissa. They didn't earn the love of Allah for the sins that they did. Exactly. This is important, guys. They didn't earn the love of Allah. What is it that makes the forerunners and the right-handers not have to do no time in hell, even though they committed sin? Because none of us are sinless. What makes them different is they did the deeds that are pleasing to Allah, that caused Allah to love them, guys. That's why you got to think. Every day that we wake up, we should ask ourselves, what can I do today to earn the love of Allah? What are the deeds that Allah loves? Any voluntary good deed. That's why I spend all day teaching. So I'll say, what can I teach today? What can I do today to make my, my teachings even more dynamic that can bring the people closer to Allah? That's how we earn a love. That's why a lot of people fast. I'm going to fast today. That's why a lot of people get up and do the do high prayer. I'm going to make the do high prayer every morning. I'm going to make the night prayer every night because this will cause a lot to love me. And whenever anything good happens to me, I'm going to say, Subhana Allahi wa bihamdihi. 
Supana Allahi wa biham dihi, because that causes Allah to love me, because he loves that. So good answer, Anissa. See, Anissa knows this stuff. Anissa came from the Bible days. You know, Anissa used to be one of them women that, a, a nun. Anissa used to be a nun. She came from the Bible days. So Anissa likes this type of stuff. This type of Akita, the Akita, 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 that's what gets you through the grade. Anissa is one of our oldest students here. She's in her 80s. So she, every day of her life, she thinks, what can she do to get through that grave to earn Allah's love? So I, I need, Anissa can talk about Akita all day long because inshallah, her Akita is correct. And that's what it's about, having the correct Akita. So that's why she know all these answers. I'm teaching y'all basic Akita that most Muslims don't have. So how can I, how, how do these people end up in the sinful group? They did not do the deeds to earn the love of Allah. That's the thing, guys. If you don't want to end up in a sinful Muslim group, do the deeds that are pleasing, and Allah will forgive you of the mistakes you make. Okay? Any other answers? What are anybody else? Well, how else do these people end up sinful? They ended up sinful, sinful because they died upon sins. They ended up in a sinful group because they didn't do the deeds to earn Allah's love. What else? Okay, Sister uh, Laili, to be a sinful Muslim. Because I don't do Rukia, I don't do Rukia either. Sister uh, Laili, I don't do Rukia. I never do Rukia. I never have people do Rukia. That makes me sinful. And I'm not superstitious. I don't believe in superstition. Does that make me a sinful? Are we supposed to be superstitious? Are we supposed to do rookie? I think you understood, misunderstood the question lately. <laughs> oh, lately, she got the question wrong. I'm sorry, baby. Lately misunderstood the question. <laughs> she knows that answer. Okay, anybody else? Okay, they didn't fulfill their obligations. Good job. Here's another answer from Facebook. How did they end up in the sinful Muslim group? Good job. They didn't fulfill their obligations. They didn't pray. And we're going to talk about that, guys, a little bit more. The people of paradise, if you make it to paradise, Allah will allow you to look down in the hellfire at the people being punished there. And the people of paradise will see a lot of Muslims in there that they knew. And they will ask them, what did you do? How did you get in that hellfire? And they will say, because we didn't pray. We didn't fast. I didn't fast during Ramadan. I lied and said I was fasting when I wasn't. You know, so this is going to be the, one of the number one reasons that a, that a lot of Muslims end up in that sinful group because they did not fulfill the obligations. I didn't wear a beard. I didn't wear, a lot of those men, a lot of Muslim men are gonna be in hell because they didn't grow their beard. Or you look at those famous personalities, you would say, there goes Shake so-and-so. Shake so-and-so, why are you in the hellfire? Uh, I used to trim my beard, y'all couldn't tell. Y'all liked how beautiful my beard was. I trimmed it every day. Trimming a beard is haram. That's why I tell y'all, be careful of these men that y'all that think are shakes. You look at them, most of them got trimmed beards. If their beard don't look like Sheikh Atlee's, if their beard don't look like Jamali's, if their beard don't look like Brother Mukhtar, the men are, are, are trimming it, especially those men with that fine hair. So y'all better be careful of calling these people shakes when they sitting there with the curse of a law on them. Any man that trims his beard has the curse of a law on him. How can he be a scholar when he's cursed publicly defying a law? Okay, any other reasons how you can end up in a sinful Muslim group? Go ahead, Precious. Precious. This is Colleen. Oh, Colleen, go ahead, baby. Um. Picking and choosing what you want to practice. 
Good job picking and choosing what parts of the dean to accept and practice. Good job. And having that's, doubt. Yeah, that'll and also doubting. Good job. Doubting Allah's laws and rules and regulations will also uh, put you in that category. Good job. See how the kids know. The kids are really smart. Yes, yeah, Sister Zarina, go ahead. Um, yes, they hate what Allah loves and um, love what Allah hates. It's like they Good say they job. believe. But, yeah. These were people that hated the things Allah loved and love the things that Allah hated. Exactly, this is why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us guys to purify our hearts. That's why we always talk about heart purification here at Sunnah Followers. We have to purify our hearts of those emotions and desires that stand between us and Allah. We have to learn to love everything that Allah loves and to only hate what he hates. Allah hates Kafirs. Why do you love them so much? Ask yourselves. I had to tell somebody today. I said, why do you love Kafirs so much? Allah hates them. They say, because they ask me, why do you hate Kafirs, Layla? I said, because Allah hates Kafirs. I don't have no respect for no Kafir. Because and, and they're not intelligent because if there was a such thing as an intelligent capper, they wouldn't be a capper. If there was a such thing as a wise capper, they wouldn't be a capper. I have no respect for cappers. I hate them. They're too stupid to realize that a law is a law. They're too stupid to submit to a law. So why do you love cappers so much? That's why I don't have no capper friends. I don't have no, I don't associate with cappers. I don't sit in their presence. I don't deal with them unless I have to. I, when I used to work, I worked with them. When I go to the store, I, I, I'm polite to them. But as far as getting close to them, talking to them, having them in my house, hanging out, I don't like you. You're an idiot. I hate cappers. You're too stupid to submit to a law. Yeah, so until we train ourselves to love what Allah loves and hate what Allah hates, guys, we'll fall in that sinful group. Good job. You guys did good with that question. Good answers. Let's look at question number four. This is an easy one. True or false? The sinful Muslims are only removed from hell through the intercession of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that true or false? They're only removed through the Prophet Muhammad's intercession. Go ahead, uh, Sister Muna. Sister Muna, go ahead. True or false? Um, this is false. Um, a sinful Muslim could also be removed um, by the intercession of um, a for or forerunner. Of a who? Of a oh, forerunner. Just a forerunner? Um. And hold on. May Leon? Uh, yeah. May Leon, go ahead, help her out. Um, I was also going to say a martyr, too. Yeah, so and we can summarize uh, that by saying what? They can be removed through the intercession of any what? Righteous person. Yeah, any what? And what are the righteous people called? Any believer Life. that's in paradise? Any be believer, exactly. Any Allah will allow whomever he wants of the believers to intercede on behalf of others. So any believer, any person that, that Allah allows in the paradise can intercede, any of them. You know, you can intercede. If you make it to paradise, you can ask Allah. If Allah allows you, Allah may say, okay, Muna, go ahead and intercede. Oh, I want to bring my mother in. Even though she wasn't practicing good, Allah, she, she believed in you. You know, and as long as that person didn't die upon shirk, as long as that person didn't die of disbeliever, Allah will let you intercede. But what about this, guys? 
Can I intercede for my grandmother who was a Christian? No, you can only intercede for Muslims. And by the way, will I even want to intercede? Will anybody who enters paradise want to intercede on behalf of any of their relatives who was not Muslim? No. No, because that's what you're not, Allah is not going to allow any of us to enter paradise harboring pity or likes for anything bad. So you will be happy with the fact that you in paradise and you won't have a problem accepting the reality that your mama is in hell because she was a capper. Why should she be in paradise? She didn't believe in a law. My mother had a good life. She lived her life in this world, but that's it. She didn't believe in a law, so I ain't got no pity for her. Burn, baby, burn. It's goat fever. I keep telling y'all that hadith. The prophet says the law is not going to allow anyone in paradise who harbors any desire for anything bad or dirty in this world. That's that dipping. You don't want to be dipped in that hellfire to made to forget the fact that your mother don't come before law. That's why y'all need to work on purifying your heart now. You better put your mothers, your love for your family who are Kafirs in their perspective. I love you cause you my mother, but you don't come before Allah. You die Kafir, that's your problem. That's your, your choice. I told you about this line. The rest is on you. I'll be sad because you was my mama. But I'm not going to sit around. I can accept the fact you knew about Islam. You chose to reject it. Shame on you. Hey, hey, hey. Y'all better teach yourselves to be able to let go. Otherwise, you got to go through that dipping. Allah will dip you in that hellfire for just a second to make you forget everything bad that you thought was good. So you're not going to be desiring. Uh, the people who are law allows to intercede on a day of judgment, they're not going to want to even intercede for no kafir. And that's the hadith about the children. Remember you guys asked yesterday, the children will intercede on their parent, for their parents, but only if the parents were Muslim. If the parents of those children were not Muslim, those children are not going to intercede for them. They're not even going to even think of them because they were kafir. So the children of the believers will intercede, but not the children of the kafirs. The children of the kafirs are in paradise being cared for by prophet Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Those children will grow up. They will enter paradise in body and spirit on the day of judgment and grow up and they will enter as 32 years old and they will marry and have their own families because we're going to talk about that because everyone from this world will be the age of 32 when they enter paradise. So those children who are right now flying around the throne of Allah in the form of a green bird, they will be the age of, 20, of 32 when they enter in body and soul. Everybody understand that? Everybody clear on that? Okay. All right. Let's look at question number five. When the sinful Muslims are removed from hell, how will they be brought back to life, so to say? How will they come back to being themselves? Sister Tony, go ahead. I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sister Tony, go ahead. I'm trying to type and call on y'all at the same time. Go ahead. Um, the Prophet Muhammad, um, so long will he was them, said that when the sinful Muslims, they will be removed from hell, we will be like um, shriveled up cucumbers from being burnt all over. And the only place that would not be burnt will be the place of Saju because Allah forbids that, pe that place from being burnt and water will be poured from paradise on you and they will, they will grow like seeds. Exactly. MashaAllah, the people of paradise will pour water over them to bring them back exactly they'll be spread out and then the people of paradise will pour water over them to revive them and bring them back mashallah sister tony good job and i like the way you answer it's easy for me to type mashallah 
Okay, good job on that. Tony's been in this class. She knows these answers. Okay, question number six. Now, this is one of the hadiths that many Muslims, uh, especially who are hypocrites, misconstrue the meaning of. Who can explain to us the person with a grain of faith? Because unfortunately, a lot of Muslims think that they don't have to practice Islam that they can live their lives in this world doing whatever they want to do, but because they got a grain of faith, they're going to come out of hell. Who can explain the person with the grain? Who is the person with the grain of faith that the prophet and Allah speaks about? Can anyone explain to us who the person with the grain of faith is? Go ahead, Sister Tom. Um, The person with the grain of faith is anyone who died upon la ilaha illallah maybe they were um they were sinful or weak but they never associated partners with the law Allah will look at them and he will look for anyone on the day of judgment with the mustard seed of faith in their heart and the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says anyone with the animal's weight of faith they will be removed from the hellfire exactly y'all understand how she explained that so if you are, are uh, you are a woman, you married a Jewish man, and your religion, you say that you part Jew, you part Muslim, and you part Kafir. <laughs> I still got a grain of faith. No, you ain't. You a Kafir. You ain't got nothing coming. Nothing coming. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. That ain't the grain of faith, okay? The grain of faith are those people who were Muslim, their religion, they declared la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, and they never committed shirk. They never uh, uh, disbelieved in Allah, but they were just weak, didn't practice the religion as they should have. They weren't people walking around married to Kafir men who are and calling themselves a Jew and a witch and all this and saying, but I still got a grain of faith. No, you going to hell and you going to bust it wide open because you ain't nothing but a low life degenerate Kafir. So be careful of that, guys. Don't sit around trying to play games with a law. You make and fool yourself. You make and fool your mother, but you cannot fool a law. He knows if you believe in him or not. Okay. Good job, Tony. Okay, let's look at the, the next question. Question number seven. What about this? Can a person die upon Islam and never, ever, ever practice the religion and still be removed from hell? What do you guys think and who can explain that? Can a person be Muslim and never practice the religion? And, but can that person still be removed from hell? And if so, how or why? Is that possible? Okay, I'm, I'm Muslim. I was born Muslim, but I ain't never prayed, never wore hijab, never gave in charity. I used to party. I had sex out of wedlock. I even had a bunch of cheering out of wedlock. I even did drugs. Did a couple of alcohols too. Plus, uh, I did. I committed a little bit of murder too. I killed a couple of people. I even raped a person. I even lied, cheated, stole. I robbed the banks. But I believe in Allah. I know there ain't no God but Allah. Can I still go to heaven in English? What do y'all think? Can I still go to heaven? What do you think? Somebody else besides Anissa. I was born Muslim. I believe in the law. I believe in the prophet, but I don't pray. I don't wear hijab, I do drugs, I fornicate, I got 10 children out of wedlock, I killed two people, I rob banks for a living, I'm a drug addict and I'm an alcoholic, I even did a couple of rapes. Can I still 
get in paradise. What do you think, Sister Rashida? Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to say yes, that person still has a chance at paradise. And um, the reason why is because if that person never associated partners with Allah during their lifetime, they can be removed from the hellfire if they didn't die upon shirk. Yes. Exactly, guys. Was there a hadith that also illustrates that? Um, the hadith that comes to mind is the man who killed um, 99 plus one. There you go. Is there another hadith that comes in mind? Go ahead, Muna. Um, the hadith yesterday that you mentioned of two brothers, one was a practicing Muslim and one was not. And the practicing Muslim brother always used to put down his non-practicing brother and tell him he was going to hell. So um, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got sick of hearing that and um, had them come before him and he had the practicing brother go to hell and the non-practicing brother go to paradise. And also, is there a story from the Quran that proves it? Go ahead, Rashida. Is there a story from the Quran that proves that too? Anybody? The man who had himself burnt and his, his, his uh, ashes scattered all over the earth because he never did a good deed in his life. But Allah forgave him because he believed in him and never associated partners. So again, that is the beauty of Allah. Allah is more merciful, guys, than anything. He's more merciful. You could be a Muslim who never did anything good in your life. But the simple fact that you never denounced the law, you never associated with him, and you knew you was wrong, that's it. You will eventually be removed from that fire because a law is that merciful. But the key is to admit you wrong, to not associate partners, to not deny a law. Most Muslims today, I know, I know a lot of Muslims that don't practice the religion. They do drugs, they fornicate, they got kids out of wedlock, they do uh, everything. Party, hardy, drop it like it's hot, even though it's not, and everything else. And then if you approach them, what if they say, so what? I can live my life having my fun. You can't have that type of attitude. But if you're one of them people, I do know a couple of other people who don't practice, who do all those bad things. And when I approach them, I say, you know, what's up? I know, Sister Layla, I know, I just, I just can't stop. Sister Layla, I just need help. I just wished I didn't do these drugs. Sister Layla, I just wished I had your strength. Oh, I just hope Allah, Allah find it in his heart to forget. This is a person, that's how that man who killed 100 was. He wanted to change. He didn't like himself. He knew what he was doing was wrong and he wanted to change. He admitted it. Just like the man who had his children burn his body and scatter his ashes. He told Allah, because I know I never did anything good and I was too ashamed to meet you. I knew I was wrong. But too many people today, guys, are arrogant. Too many Muslims, you, I ain't got to wear hijab. That man that killed a hundred didn't have that attitude. He said, I know I shouldn't kill. He didn't say, I can do what I want. You don't fall in the category of these people if you don't think that what you're doing is wrong. If you don't own it and say, Allah, I know I'm wrong and I wish I could change. It's just that, but no, you're arrogant. You only live once. I ain't got to wear no hijab. That stuff is crazy. That's barbaric. That's back in the old days. We don't live in that time and era. 
What you mean I got to pray five times a day? I should be able to pray whenever I want to. God know what's in my heart. I ain't got to hit the flow five times to show him. That's a kafir. That ain't no believer. This is a person that's denying what Allah says and thinks he can pick and choose how to worship his Lord when he really don't believe in his Lord. Does everybody see the difference? So people are arrogant. That's why Allah hates arrogance. If you're too arrogant to accept the truth, you're too arrogant to change. You're a kafir. But if you're not arrogant, if you're one of those people that know that that's just weak, too weak to stand up for yourself, these people have a chance. Y'all see the mercy of Allah? I wouldn't give them the chance, but I'm not Allah. Allah still gives these people the chance to be forgiven. He still will allow that man, that Muslim boy who was born Muslim, who never prayed, who never fasted, who sold drugs for a living, committed murder, did 10 years in jail for that, robbed a bank, did another 20 years. But he never denied la ilaha illallah. He knew that his lifestyle was bad and wrong. Allah will allow his mother or his grandmother or his great, great, great grandmother to intercede for him. Ain't that something? Because everybody got a mama and ain't nothing like the love of a mama. A mama will love its bad seed. And if nobody else intercedes for that person, it's mama will or it's grandma. Ain't that something? The mercy of Allah. Okay. All right. And let's look at the last question. We talked about how Allah will allow any believer, if he wishes, to intercede. But what people will not be allowed to intercede, even though they call themselves Muslim? I ain't talking about the people that, that just admit they Kafir. I'm talking about what people who call themselves Muslims, Allah will never allow to intercede for themselves or anyone else. Go ahead, Tony. Um, the people, the people that will be not allowed to intercede on the day of judgment will be the innovators because they um they set up partners with him and they what they believe contradicts Islam and they change Islam. And the exactly. law says we forgive everything except for setting up partners with them. Innovators and people with corrupt ideologies that oppose Islam. Do y'all think Allah is going to allow uh, Elijah Muhammad to do anything on the day of judgment? Because he claimed he was the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he claimed that he was the nation of Islam. He's going to be dragged by his face and thrown in hell because his ideology a totally contradicted Islam. He was not even a Muslim. He ain't got nothing coming. The Qadrajites, the Qadrajites, they won't be able to intercede for anyone because their ideology totally contradicts Islam. They're the ones that exist today that still go around saying that anyone who dies upon a major sin, you're never coming out of hell. Where does Allah say that? Allah says he forgives all sins except for shirk and disbelief. He forgives murder, everything except shirk and disbelief. But the Qadrajites, they say if you die upon a major sin, you ain't never coming out of hell. That ideology contradicts la ilaha illallah, so them people ain't got nothing coming. That's why it's important for us to assure that we have the correct aqidah, that our belief system is correct. That's why here at this website, as Sunnah followers, we put more emphasis on aqidah than anything else. And after Akita, our emphasis is on the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
because he's our example. Him and his companions are the example as to how to get to paradise, how to do the deeds that are pleasing to a lot. Does everybody understand that? So we have to work on our belief system. Make sure that your Akita is not corrupt. You don't want to be one of those people saying, oh, he's a Kafir because he didn't pray. Allah didn't say that. Allah did not say that people who don't pray are Kafirs. Allah says if the person denies that praying is an obligation, that's what makes them a Kafir. A lot of people don't practice the religion because they're weak or they don't even understand it correctly. Maybe that person doesn't know the virtues of praying. Maybe he it hasn't been explained to him, you know, how serious a sin it is to not pray. You can't call him a Kafir unless he denies it. Just because that sister is not wearing hijab, we can't call her a Kafir. We can't say she going to hell. How you know? Maybe her grandmother will intercede for her and pull her sorry butt out of it. Long as she didn't commit shirt. Long as she didn't die denying that what she's doing is wrong. So we have to be careful, guys. That's why we don't call Muslims kafirs. That's why we don't even call them hypocrites. I can't call you a hypocrite because I don't know. Even though I can say you have the signs of a hypocrite, if you're a person that habitually lies, I can tell you that you have one of the signs of hypocrisy. If you're a person that's always questioning Islam, I can say that you have the behavior an attitude of one, but can I call you a hypocrite? No. Can I say that, oh, Sister Amatula is a hypocrite? No. Nope. I can say she act like one, but I can't call her one. Everybody understand that. We have to be careful what we say out of our mouths about other Muslims that can take them. We call ourselves taking them out of Islam. We're really taking ourselves out. Okay, any questions about any of these answers? You guys did very good. The, the, the lecture is real short. The lecture is only gonna be a couple of minutes cause what I'm gonna do is speak about the people that will be, that are in paradise right now. And uh, I got all the Dalil because as one of the Imams here, um, is the Imam Malik asked me to put up all them Hadiths for y'all. Okay, so I'm getting ready to, uh, let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. And today, what we're going to do is speak about, by the way, I'm not breaking up, right? In the Zoom room, everything's clear still? Anybody? Yes, you're clear. Yeah, I you're haven't, I'm not breaking at all, right? Good. Because we had a storm here. Okay. So for those of you, when you guys go to the look at the lecture later on YouTube, Hell in Paradise Session 23, we're going to answer the question as to who is in paradise now. And who will be in there before the day of judgment? Okay. And I want to remind everybody, everybody knows the first human being to ever enter paradise was Adam. And then his wife, but Allah cast them both out. Allah tells us in the interpretation of the meaning. We said, oh, Adam, live you and your wife in the garden and eat the bountiful things there. Oh, Adam, you and your wife live in the garden and enjoy its good things as you wish, but don't go near this tree or you will run into harm. So Allah allowed Adam, alayhi salam, and his wife to live in, in paradise until they disobeyed him. And then when they disobeyed him, uh, he cast them out. As the law tells us in the interpretation of the meaning, we had already beforehand taken the trust of Adam, but he forgot and we found on his part no firm resolve. When we told the angels to prostrate to Adam, they prostrated, but not Iblis. He refused. He was one of the jinn. Then we said, oh, Adam, this is an enemy to you and your wife, so do not allow him to get you both out of the garden so that you are landed in misery. But Shaitan whispered evil to him and said, O oh Adam, shall I lead you to the tree of eternity? Now this is where the Christians differ with us. This is why no Muslim on this planet 
should own what they think is called the Bible or the Torah. Uh, they don't exist. Allah tells us in the Quran that he destroyed the Bible and he destroyed the Torah and he replaced them with the Quran. There is no Bible or Torah on this earth. And then Allah tells us that whatever good he put in the Bible, whatever good he put in the Torah, if you want to know what they what if they were, they're in the Quran, the Ten Commandments, the story of Jesus, Mary, everything is in the Quran. So these books that you Muslims are reading today are books written by homosexuals. King James was a homosexual. Google him and study his life. King James was a homosexual uh, Kaffir who wrote that book. Okay? And they say that Adam and Eve ate from some apple tree or whatever. No, it was the tree of eternity. Because what is it that man has always craved? Man has always craved immortality. We want to live forever. That's why we love Edward. That's why we love Jacob. We love vampires, werewolves. We love the idea of living eternally. That's what Adam did. He made the mistake of believing Iblis when Iblis told him, if you eat from this tree, you will be immortal like the angel. He chose to eat on his own and his wife chose to eat it too. And that's how they got cast out. Okay. That's the story of Adam and Eve as given to us in the Quran. You don't have to read King James, the homosexuals book because King James was a liar and a Kaffir. The original Bible and Torah is not on earth and it won't be, ever be on earth. Like Allah says, there's no need for them. The Quran completed and perfected them. Hello! Shame on you Muslims for reading them man-made homosexual books. Okay, so the first human beings to ever enter into a uh, uh, paradise was Adam and Eve, but they got cast out. So now that brings us to the question that a lot of people ask, well, is there anyone in paradise now? The correct answer is no one will enter paradise in body and soul until the day of judgment. But there are the souls of people in paradise now. And I taught you guys that when we went over hell, okay? Allah tells us and the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains to us that the souls of the martyrs are in paradise right now. We have uh, a wonderful hadith from Sahih Muslim where some of the uh, companions asked Ibn Masood to explain the meaning where Allah says in the Quran, Think not of those who are killed in the way of Allah as being dead. They are still living. So just like people today, when you read that verse of the Quran, a lot of people think, okay, well, that means when I die, I'm not dead. I'm still living. Ibn Masood, who the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for, asking Allah to give him a deep understanding of the Quran, and Allah answered, he explained the meaning of that verse. He said, we too asked the prophet about it. And the prophet said that verse means that the souls of the martyrs are in the stomach of green birds and they have lights suspended from the throne of Allah. They fly around paradise wherever they wanna go and they take shelter in those lights and Allah will come to them and ask them from time to time, do you need anything? And they will say, what could we need when you have allowed us to fly wherever we wish here? So the souls of the martyrs, the true martyrs, 
Anyone who dies a martyr, their soul is in the belly of a green bird flying around the throne of a law in paradise. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah puts their souls into green birds which fly along the rivers of paradise and eat the, its fruit and they nestle in lamps of gold in the shade of Allah's throne. And when they have had their fill of food and drink, they ask, who will tell our brothers about us? Who will tell them that we are alive in paradise and that we are given such beautiful provisions so that they too can be interested in fighting in the way of Allah? So and Allah will answer them and say, I will tell them about you. And so that's why Allah sent down the verse in the Quran saying, do not consider those who die in the way of Allah's to be dead. So again, I tell you guys, every verse of that Quran that was revealed was revealed because something happened or something was said. So when you read that verse of the Quran, Allah sent it down in response to the companions who wanted to know about martyrs, okay? So the souls of the martyrs are in the form of green birds flying around the throne of Allah. And not just the martyrs, anyone who dies in good standing with Allah, any believer, his soul, her soul, is in paradise too. And we talked about this. What's the soul of a believer? You were a Muslim. You lived your, your life each day practicing a religion. You fulfilled your obligations. You prayed your prayers every day. You fasted Ramadan. You wore hijab. You grew your beard. You fulfilled your obligations. And whenever you committed a sin, you repented. You asked the Lord to forgive you. So you died in good standing with the law. This is the person that who Allah will not put in the hellfire, but instead he will put his soul in the form of a green bird in paradise. Listen to what the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the souls of the believers are in paradise as birds in the trees and the souls of the martyrs are in the stomachs of the green birds in paradise flying as they wish. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the believer soul is a bird that eats from the fruit of the trees of paradise until it returns back to its body on the day of judgment. So these hadiths are all the proofs or the dalil that I've given you about this stuff. So if you die in good standing with Allah and you, or you die a martyr, you're in the green bird. And then on the day of judgment, your soul will be put back into your regular body. And then that's when we have to deal with the judging. Okay. If you are fun, a forerunner, you don't have to be judged. If you are a forerunner, Allah will tell you after he put your body back in your soul back in the body to go stand by the Sirat bridge. You ain't got to be judged. If you a person of the right hand, Allah will put your soul back in your body until you go and wait to be judged. Sinful Muslims, their souls are not in the body of green birds. Sinful Muslims are in the hellfire when they in the grave. The only type of Muslims whose soul is in green birds are those who believe in Allah and who practice this religion. If you didn't wear hijab, I'm sorry, sister, you got to burn. Okay? The green bird are those who died in good standing with the law. Okay? Also, the souls of the prophets and the souls of the children who died before puberty. A lot of people ask, well, where is um, Moses? 
Where's Abraham? Their souls are in paradise too, in the form of green birds. And also any children that die below the age of puberty. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, O oh, Prophet, who is in paradise? He said, all the prophets are in paradise and the martyrs are in paradise and the young children who die are in paradise and the infant that is buried alive is in paradise. That's why I tell you guys, stop posting up on Facebook those morbid pictures of children killed in wars. Have some respect have some dignity because the believer we don't mourn for the children i repeat the believer we don't mourn for the children i repeat the believer we don't mourn for the children because we know our children have been spared the filth of this world they are flying around the throne of Allah, waiting for the day when they soul will enter their body and they can intercede for us. And this is what a Palestinian told me. I got some friends that live in Gaza. They say, Sister Layla, tell them people at your website, don't cry for our babies. And don't post pictures of our dead women and men and children on Facebook. It's a sacrilege. The prophet Muhammad didn't even, he, he went off on the companions because they dragged the women of who, who uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the women of, uh, of Hunain through the battlefield. He said, you let them women see their dead men and men and dead children. Shame on you. And they were Kafir. The prophet told the companions have dignity. So what would he say for you low life, emotional, stupid Muslims today, 2022, got your Facebook pages filled with dead babies from Palestine, dead women and men, shame on you stupid Muslims. Have some dignity and respect as the Palestinians I know who live in Gaza say, don't cry for our babies. Intercede for us. And don't cry for our men because they gave up their soul being in the way of Allah. You tell them Palestinians that live in America, if they care so much, boom, join us. Otherwise, keep us off their Facebook pages. That's what the Palestinians I know say. Hello. My brother's married to one. Hello. So y'all need to get a clue and have some dignity. That's what, that's what differentiates us Muslims from the Kafir. We don't cry. Of course, it's sad to lose a child, but we know that our child is in a better place, that Allah took that child for a reason that Allah spared that child from the fitting of this world. And anyway, our children didn't belong to us anyway. They were gifts given to us by Allah for a short time to test us. So should our children die in war? Should our children die in sickness? We take it with dignity and know that that's one or two or three or even four that will intercede for us on the day of judgment, that will take me by my finger and say, oh Allah, let my grandmama in paradise. So you weak Muslims here in the year 2022, y'all need to get that filth off your Facebook pages because all you doing is stirring terrorism. All you're doing is making the weak Muslims become stupid and go bomb and you are humiliating the believers. You are showing their peace, which is a sacrilege in Islam. We don't do that. Some dignity. And you wonder why Allah is punishing them. We're a sick nation today. We're nothing like those companions.
and you got the nerve to think you're going to be a forerunner? How can you think that you will be a forerunner when you are posting pictures of dead Muslim people on Facebook? You ain't no forerunner. You better pray you ain't in that sinful group. Hello. Okay. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, all the souls of the prophets are in paradise. The souls of the martyrs are in paradise. The souls of the young children who die are in paradise. And even the infants buried alive are in paradise. And also, so nobody will enter paradise physically until the day of judgment, guys. We won't enter paradise physically until the day of judgment. Now, some of the Muslims have asked me, well, what about when the prophet Muhammad alayhi wa sallam, met the other prophets? We're going to talk about that. He met them in Jerusalem. Okay, and then he met them in the different heavens, the different skies, the different skies, the different skies. I tell you in English, what we refer to as heaven in Arabic are the skies. There are seven different skies above us, guys. Paradise consists of many levels too, but it's two different words. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met these others in the different skies. And we're gonna talk about that. And also he was allowed to look in paradise. The Prophet Muhammad was allowed to look in paradise. He saw the footstep of Bilal. Bilal was not in paradise. Bilal was still living. He saw the footsteps to signify, okay? So we'll talk about that. But as far as entering paradise physically, none of us will enter paradise physically until the day of judgment. But the souls are there right now of the martyrs, believers, and the children and the prophets. And also, we went over this hadith before. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when any of us die, we will be shown our position in paradise or hell morning and evening. If you are a person of paradise, you'll be shown your position. And if you are a person of hell, you'll be shown it too. And you will be told that this is where you will stay until the day of judgment. And we talked about this, Hadi, the people who will be of the sinful group, who will be punished in that hellfire, when you in that grave, you will be shown your position in paradise, what could have been yours or what may be yours there. And you'll be shown what could be or may be your permanent home in that hellfire, okay? All right, so we're going to stop right here for today. I hope I broke this down and made it clear to everyone. I gave you all the dalio. So no one is there physically. The souls are there now, okay? When you die, either your soul is in paradise or your soul is in hell, one or the other, not in between, all right? Okay, I'm going to stop right here for today. Uh, I want to remind everybody I have another class. Um, today will be the first day of the uh, series on the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today I'm going to go over the physical description. A lot of you want to know how did the Prophet Muhammad look, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to go into detail describing how he looked, so hopefully you'll be able to picture him in your mind. He was a very handsome man, extremely handsome, as all the prophets were. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here. Supanakalahuma wa bihamdika, a shadow on laila haila anta, a stock wa tubu ilaika. Are there any questions or comments?